This is a special session financed or hosted by the Intellectual Property Issues and Cultural Heritage Project being run out of Simon Fraser University and it's been coordinated by Lena Mortensen from University of Toronto and myself with uh, the input from folks that are on the Cultural Tourism Working Group. The topic of my presentation as you can see is writing, speaking, uh, perf and performance the dialectic in the law between the preservation and protection of cultural heritage and its presentation for 21st century tourists. The reason I read all of that is because it's very ver verbose. And that's really the point of my presentation is that there are a lot of written words that uh, overlie and dictate or attempt to dictate cultural tourism, but it's the unwritten and unspoken and the oral uh, and uh, human performance that interplays in, in, in all of that, or is involved in all of that, that really is um, uh, critical and, and must be understood in this context. The short version of, of this, a simpler version, a way to say the same thing, is sharing experience and building knowledge, which is the theme of this conference. Um, this conference is here in Stolo country, which, who are the people of the river. And what I want to emphasize is that this process is a continuous dialogue. It is, a dial it is an ongoing, flowing process, like a river. Lenona Victor's presentation was, was really powerful because she spoke about how uh, the experience that she has is one of a weaving process. The uh, swokwe, uh, if I hope I said that correctly, um, woven blanket. That her experience, the cultural experience that that the Stolo peoples have, is like a a, wo a weaving process, a warp and a woof, a back and a forth, and what. If, I want to compliment all of you who are here this late in the day because what I want to do is to try to relate back to things, to other presentations and other experiences earlier today and try to place it in, the con in context. If you were in the longhouse at lunchtime, you heard some wonderful storytelling and you saw some great performances. If you were here after, in this room after that, you heard some very uh, excellent and comprehensive and really um, educational, edifying presentations about governance, about the law, about written laws, about international laws, about Stolo politics. What I'm going to be talking about is that dialogue, that warp and woof, that weaving process between what happened in the Longhouse and what people talked about in the session right after that, the, the written stories. During approximately the past uh, 20 or 30 years, there has been a proliferation of local, national, and international code statutes, regulations, and treaties, and a concomitant growth in persuasive customary law aimed at protecting the intellectual property and cultural heritage rights of indigenous or native peoples in general, and those rights in the cultural tourism context specifically. So that was the session just before this one the laws and the codes, and then within that, we have to understand the cultural protocols, the cultural tourism protocols that Lena spoke about, didn't just grow up spontaneously. They were an outgrowth of this proliferation of laws, which creates certain kinds of rights, which dictated in part the written protocols that uh, were developed in conjunction with and for the indigenous peoples. And this is the uh, United Nations definition of indigenous peoples, just for context. Now, for example, the 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity uh, is one of them, and I'll talk specifically about Article H.A. in a second. UNESCO's 2003 Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, the 2079 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was discussed at length in the session prior to this one. Uh, the UN Convention, of, uh, UC, uh, the, the CBD it's called, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, was developed in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro at the Earth Summit. Article 8J specifically requires that each party, meaning nation states, respect, preserve, and maintain knowledge, 
innovations and practices of indigenous and local communities embodying traditional lifestyles. Those things that are of interest to tourists for the conservation and use of sustainable use of biological diversity in this case. But what's critical about it is that underlying it, the, the premise underlying this provision is that it gives indigenous peoples the right to control access to those traditions. And that means to, the right to say no. Now if you were here earlier this morning, you heard one of the Stolo artists talk about how he likes to say no. He has that right under international law. And that is what is built into many of the cultural tourism protocols that Lena spoke about just a few minutes ago. And it's based, it's not just something that indigenous peoples are coming up with. This is based in a, is a huge, huge groundswell of international documents. This is a, this is a, uh, these are a compilation of many of them that were in existence about 10 years ago. You could probably double this now. And this is just one of those documents, which I'll be talking about in a moment. That's the World Intellectual Property Organization's Traditional Knowledge Documentation Toolkit. Some people refer to it as the as WIPO's or the World Intellectual Piracy Organization's Traditional Knowledge Documentation Toolkit. <coughs> but the, uh, they're all in formal language. And by the way, that's the uh, website to that toolkit. But they all depend, all of these written laws and codes depend upon the implementation by those indigenous peoples and local communities that we've been speaking about and that I, used the, the, that I, I defined using the United Nations definitions uh, a few minutes ago. Especially in the cultural tourism context, and these cultural protocols that are now being developed and have been developed over the past 10 or 20 years. So indigenous people's view of written laws are through oral non-written communications. Lend, they're lenses of centuries old traditions and they implement them through storytelling, songs, dances, and ritual performances. That's the longhouse. So what we have is a dynamic between the longhouse at lunch and the written codes and protocols and laws and international um, statutes and cases, which I'll be talking about in a minute. I'm also a cultural anthropologist. Um, I've worked with uh, computer software companies over the years, practiced intellectual property. Uh, and as a cultural anthropologist, I've negotiated and advocated for the intellectual property rights of indigenous peoples. About, uh, what I'm gonna talk about is based upon uh, some thoughts I have, that dialectic, this dialectic, but it's, it's in its, it's, I hope to develop what I'm going to be talking about today through IPINCH and through the people on the IPINCH uh, Cultural Tourism Committee. So this is not a finished product. These are just, I'm, I'm just want to discuss and, uh, this, this kind of tension between the spoken and the, uns, the, the written and the, and, the, and the spoken word that exists in the cultural tourism context. And it's going to be based upon, however, over 44 years of field work in participant observation of cultural tourism spanning at least 1969 through today. And uh, this has been as in my role as either an ethnographer, uh, consultant, attorney, or tourist, and usually as a combination of two or three of those personas throughout the world in North America, Mesoamerica, Europe, Africa, Oceania, and Asia. The first one I want to talk about briefly is the Ute, Ute Mountain Utes. The <laughs> tribal headquarters is in southwestern Colorado. Right, it's contiguous to Mesa Verde National Park. When I did my field work there about 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, Mesa Verde was an internationally known park with um, pre, preeminent national park, famous for its cliff dwellings dating back to about 1200 AD, which uh, housed the so-called Anasazi or ancient people. Um, few people outside of that area realized, however, that the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation had, that's a physical location, it's in the so-called Four Corners area of, of uh, the United States, near the Navajo Reservation and not too far from the Hopi uh, Reservation, but uh, there's, and there's the Southern Ute and uh, Ute Mountain Ute tribes right next to the Mesa Verde National Park. Few people realized at that time that uh, the Ute Reservation had cliff dwellings that were probably at least equal to those in Mesa Verde. 
but providing access to those sites to the public offered a, and providing uh, access to those sites offered a potential tourist attraction on the reservation that potentially could create all those things that we talked about, jobs and revenue on the reservation, um, interactions and uh, cultural um, uh, revitalization. But among other things, what all you have to also realize is, is that um, indigenous peoples are the most disadvantaged peoples in the world from, a, from an income and employment perspective, and particularly in the United States. So what cultural tourism potentially offered was a vital um, resource for in, overcoming extreme poverty and high unemployment. And it typified a situation that typifies many Indian reservations and indigenous people situations around the world. Now, what I wrote about in my ethnographic work at that time was about the local political economy. It was very similar to the kinds of things I wrote about were very similar to the presentation that Keith Carlson gave earlier this afternoon about the Stolo. Uh, there is a local history of white, um, a, a white trader who could have been the, the Methodist preach, preacher here on the Stolo Reservation, who basically co-opted and utilized and used the, the local politics on the tribe for the benefit of white people to sort of uh, rubber stamp and justify many of the uh, expropriations that were taking place, both in terms of land and resources. And one of the underlying, but not the only factors, delaying the development of this rich cultural resource of cliff dwellings um, on the reservation, this is an example of the Ute country uh, in southwestern Colorado, which by the way the Utes at one time really occupied and owned, if you will, the entire state of Colorado, not just a small corner of it, and that's, that's the kind of country. There's some very rich artifacts back in that area which are miles away from the current reservation. Um, this, is a, this is a cliff dwelling on the reservation that I visited about 15 years later. Um, in what's now known as Ute Mountain Tribal Park. And what I experienced at that time was a whole different experience from my experience in Mesa Verde National Park. The guide was a Ute. He was not a trained, a formally trained um, Anglo archaeologist. And the way, he, the way he talked about the Eagle Nest House was to tell stories. And instead of talking about an ancient group of people that nobody knew, that no longer existed, he brought, it, brought those people to life and showed how that rich historical past had some kind of a link to a vibrant present in the Four Corners area. Now, only two months ago, lawyers on the Ute Mountain Reservation uh, we're at a program that I attended, or gave a presentation at a program I attended similar to this one, in which they talked about repatriation under NAGPRA, the Native American Grave Protection Repatriation Act. And uniformly, they and the Utes who also spoke at that conference talked about a powerful unwritten code of conduct and communication on the reservation that served as a filter for the written law. One of the stories that one of the lawyers told was about how he had seen things that he'd never saw before in his life because of his interaction and experiences with the Ute Mountain Utes, specifically <laughs> flora and fauna in the area. And they, he was privileged to attend a NAGPRA repatriation reburial ceremony. And he looked around at one of those and saw that um, he saw animals, specifically deer and eagles that he'd never seen before. What he said, though, was that uh, he, he has been to other ceremonies since then, and he would be with his Ute Mountain Ute uh, friends and colleagues, and they would say, look at those animals, see the animals, and he wouldn't see them. The question is why? Well, if you, I'm going to skip ahead to the sound of, so sound of Southern Africa, which uh, Rachel Girardo is going to talk about in more detail in a few minutes. Uh, and my experiences there with the Hootia plant, which is up uh, uh, when I was there about 10 years ago, um, writing a, a, 
case study about how the Hudia plant that was used for 20,000 years by the sand peoples and uh, to develop a bioactive compound that was patented by South Africa that grew in this, in this transfrontier park um, where there were animals like Gemsbach um, and uh, Kalahari lions and wildebeest and springbok but really it was if when I was there for the most part it looked like a desolate uh, desert I was given a tour of that if you will uh, Transfrontier Park though by one of the great tra sand trackers uh, Fat Pete was his name uh, he was sort of, sort of uh, the uh, Wayne Gretzky if you will of sand trackers and he would sit there and uh, look at the sand and then point to the sky and show me a couple of eagles flying high, wet his fingers, uh, hold them up for a few seconds, counting as the wind drew the blue, uh, dry wind blew. Then through his interpreter he would say, in 15 minutes you will see a herd of springbok come over the hill, heading in that direction, and they will be followed by a Kalahari lion. And of course, I didn't see anything but the desert. But he was right. In about 15 minutes, that's what happened. And um, what I'm trying to convey is that he could see, he knew about this world around him in ways that I didn't. But I was learning from him. I was able to learn this incredible, it's rich cultural experience. Okay, that plant that was, became a, a, a multi, potentially a million dollar, multi-million dollar revenue source for the San Peoples, for him, had a greater significance. It went back 20,000 years and it was something that he used as part of his tracking to keep him going. He no longer would feel hungry or thirsty and that's why that plant was uh, potentially very valuable to the, to the rest of the world. Uh, but it was the reason why South Africa was able to develop this patent is because they had this interaction over the course of about a hundred years with sand peoples who would share that experience. And what the sand have been able to do is not only to uh, maintain and revitalize this cultural tradition, but also to recapture some of the revenue from this patent by um, emphasizing, uh, by enforcing international law to um, protect their rights to this heritage. Now, um, fortunately, I'm running out of time, and Alexis talked about the Maori at great length. There was a treaty, uh, a, a very famous case called the Y262 Flora and Fauna Claim that took place over 20 years. Uh, it was tried in part in Rotorua, where she showed, showed some photographs. I was present at that uh, uh, hearing and, and was able to testify. But what's significant is that Many, many Maori also testified over the course of that 20 years. And the way that they testified was to go out into sites, to perform dramas, to tell stories, and to perform rituals. And one of the outcomes of that was that they were able to demonstrate as part of that hearing that sacred sands at certain sites were vital to, uh, as guideposts, to migratory birds. And those migratory bird patterns would be disrupted if these sands, these sacred sands were somehow disrupted. And they were able to tell that through stories, drama, ritual, on site. So the point of what I'm trying to say is that if you go to the Ute Mountain Utes, if you go to the San, if you go to uh, New Zealand and, we're in, and the Maori, um, there are very, very powerful ways of communicating cultural tradition within the context and, and, and um, under the um, uh, uh, utilizing international law but it's the the stories the interaction between the lawyers and the indigenous peoples the interaction between the ethnographers and the archaeologists and the indigenous peoples that creates the, this, this, this vital resurgence um, and heritage, in heritage, that uh, can be recaptured through tourism. A local anthropologist, Julie Krukchenk, and uh, she's written a book that I commend to all of you called Do Glaciers Listen? And she's written uh, eloquently in many places about the power of stories, particularly as they relate, though, to 
tourism and uh, national parks and World Heritage Centers. And uh, just briefly, let me just quote sort of the, uh, uh, so there's many great passages in this book that I commend to you, but um, she says, narrative reflection, collect recollections and memories about history, tradition, and life experience represent distinct and powerful bodies of local knowledge that have to be appreciated in their totality rather than fragmented into data. And so what I am saying to you is part is that when you go out into these sites what, and, and view these written laws in action, you have to understand, you begin to see them acted out across centuries of time and as part of all nature. It's part of the sky, it's part of the earth, it's part of surface water, it's part of subsurface water, it's part of water, uh, steam, ice, snow, and flora and fauna. And so that's what she, when she, she says that they have to be understood in their totality rather than fragmented into data if we were to learn anything from them. And she says, memories covered by these layers of sanctuary park and world heritage site are also being re-energized as human history emerges from melting glaciers. She says it is the stories about these interactions that must be captured and told and listened to. In both scientific and indigenous communities, melting glaciers will quite probably contribute to new interpretations of the past and present. And as my native uh, informant advised us, we must listen to different stories. And she says that must claim our attention. Uh, in conclusion, this holistic view of which I speak and Professor Cruikshank writes is imbued with ritual and therefore deep-seated spiritual significance. This significance is communicated most often orally and in stories. It is therefore vitally important as tourists, as ethnographers, and as lawyers enforcing complicated, detailed, and voluminous cultural heritage laws, that we also listen to the stories that indigenous peoples, and especially their spiritual elders, are telling us, because, as Professor Cruikshank implies, the glaciers do also. Oh.